Uh, well, good afternoon and cheers to everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. It's an hour later in Florida than it is in Pensacola. So it's almost five o'clock here, right? Um, and I can't not talk, I can't not have a lovely fermented beverage and talk about fermentation. Um, I get really excited for this uh, talk because it combines some of my favorite things, archeology span and fungus and fermentation and beer and cheese and all sorts of delicious things. So um, we'll get right into it. I do wanna start, uh, before I get to the history and the archeology span bits, just with a little bit of the science um, of what fermentation is. So in general, it's a process uh, that in which microorganisms break down sugars into energy um, specifically in anaerobic settings. So our classic example is you have yeast um, and they eat sugars. And if you put it in a nice fermentation tank and you cut off the oxygen supply, um, then they will create some lovely byproducts like carbon dioxide and alcohol. Um, and they don't get as much energy in this setting, but they get more energy than they would if they weren't doing fermentation, right? Um, so it's a really cool thing that some of these uh, bacteria and, and yeast and, and different things have kind of adapted to be able to do. Um, and just to, to note that we do have spontaneous fermentation. So if anyone tried to make their own sourdough starter at uh, while we've been stuck at our homes during the pandemic, uh, you'll notice after a few days that water and flour just starts to bubble and you have spontaneous fermentation, right? You have attracted whatever natural yeast was in the air and uh, they found those yummy things to eat and then they started the spontaneous fermentation. Um, once you have that going though, you now have a starter, right? You have a starter culture. So um, most kind of modern fermentation is done uh, using starter cultures, using kind of pre-selected yeast and, and bacteria and such. Um, and it's a way to control the process. It's a way to have, uh, especially if you're making batch after batch after batch of something to make sure that you have quality control that you know kind of stems throughout all these things, um, control the flavors, control the, the textures and, and all of the things that, uh, that you get as a result of the fermentation. Um, but as we see a lot of maybe ancient fermentation could have been a little more spontaneous than that. Um, and I also just, I love words. So I will let you guys know that zymology is the name for the science of fermentation. Um, so we're gonna do some archaeozymology here tonight. We're gonna talk about ancient fermentation or this afternoon. Uh, and there's lots of different kinds of fermentation. So the most, the one that comes to everyone's mind is um, ethanol fermentation. So this is when you have yeast and it's breaking down starches and sugars and it's creating that alcohol and carbon dioxide byproduct. And of course, you know, beers, wines, meads, bread, ciders, any of those kinds of things. Um, but there are all sorts of different types of fermentation. They don't always involve yeast. Um, sometimes they involve bacteria. Sometimes they involve scoobies, which are symbiotic colonies of bacteria and yeast. So all sorts of things going on in there. Um, but the type of fermentation affects, you know, the kind of uh, foods, the kind of foods that you're trying to ferment and then the, the kind of product that you're gonna get at the end of it as well. Um, but of course the star of a lot of fermentation is Saccharomyces cerevisa, uh, also known as the sugar fungus. And this is uh, the same species of yeast that is used in bread making and brewing and wine making and making cider and you know any of these kinds of things, anything that's producing ethanol and carbon dioxide. Um, is, is made from Saccharomyces cerevisa, but there's tons and tons of subspecies and different varieties and strains that um, I'm, I'm a big beer drinker. So uh, you'll, if you've ever made beer or looked at beer labels or thought about this, you'll notice that, you know, there's different types of yeast that you use to get different flavors of beer. You use, you know, a Belgian strand to get that nice floral flavors. And you might use something that's a little heartier for an IPA or something that has a floral flavor, right? Um, but it's it's essentially the same kind of, of yeast. Uh, it's just different different kind of substrains and, and varieties and, and types. So, um, so just to, to think like an anthropologist for a minute, you know, we like to answer these big questions about what people are doing. So why would people uh, ferment things? Why have we stumbled across fermentation and why have we continued to do it? Um, and some of these reasons are out of practical needs. Um, fermentation is a great way to preserve food, especially if you have a huge, you know, bumper crop of, of uh, cabbage, right? How are you gonna get it to last through the winter? Um, and one way is to ferment it, to turn it into sauerkraut, to turn it into kimchi. Um, 
and this uh, essentially creates, you know, this great little preservation bubble that happens, right? Because there's a lot of things that are produced during fermentation, like acids and alcohols and other enzymes. Um, and these can prevent decomposition. They can pre prevent, um, you know, the food from spoiling, essentially. Um, so something interesting to note, um, you know, a lot of these things can also be kind of uh, defensive mechanisms for the microorganisms that are doing the fermentation. Um, so for instance, uh, penicillin is actually an enzyme that is produced by uh, certain kinds of molds. And uh, it's specifically, cre you know, created by the mold to fend off um, the food source that it's found from other bacteria, right? So um, it's an enzyme that kills or inhibits the growth of bacteria. So scientists figured this out and that's how we were able to harness it and use it as an antibiotic for ourselves. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisa is one of the very few yeast that can survive at high alcohol contents. And that's once again, like the survival mechanism that they have. Um, so they just keep creating alcohol and then everything else is gonna die and then they get to eat all those sugars on their own. It can enhance nutrition. So I'm sure everyone has noticed the new fad of having things that are cultured and how it's great for your, your, your gut and your microbiome and all of these things. Um, but fermentation can, you know, enhance the nutritional properties. Um, it can it can help us absorb them more easily. Um, it can get rid of harmful toxins or just make things easier to digest. So uh, milk is a really great example. Uh, people, I mean, a lot of people still are lactose intolerant, but you know, human beings are like the only creatures, only mammals that will keep ingesting milk past like infancy. Um, so fermentation may have played a role in, in our lactose tolerant. Um, and, you know, a lot of these other things that are created through fermentation can enhance the, the nutrition of the food as well. So, um, you know, we're, we're one of the only creatures that also cook food and cook is kind of, cooking food is kind of a jump start on digestion for us. So uh, fermentation can do the same kind of thing where it starts to break down um, the, the cabbage or the, the cucumbers or, you know, whatever else we're trying to eat. Um, but it can reduce the resources that you use for that. So from kind of a uh, an environmental, you know, this kind of cost benefit analysis that you can do, you know, for fermenting foods uh, are a good use of resources because they don't involve a lot of resources. A lot of this can happen spontaneously. Um, so you don't have to go out and get a bunch of, of firewood and, and, you know, build a, a, an oven or a smoker or things like that. Um, and you can get more bang for your buck out of the food and keep it lasting longer and all these great things. So this is, you know, probably some of the reasons that we um, discovered, you know, we, when we discovered fermentation, we got really excited about it as, as humans and kept it up. Um, but at this point, a lot of it's also kind of cultural practices. Um, so, you know, we, we grow up with certain kinds of foods and um, it's part of the, the cuisine of our, um, of our culture. It also just becomes things that we really enjoy to eat. Um, so, you know, some of this also has to do with, um, with flavors and with food experiences and with traditions that get passed down um, and, you know, other kinds of things of that nature. So it becomes almost a, a choice that we, we continue to make to keep doing fermentation. And I also just want to point out that alcohol production is like the number one reason that we ferment and it's not just for uh, recreational purposes, right? And even if you are not a, a drinker, you are still a consumer, a consumer of alcohol. Um, alcohol is used in all sorts of things. It, it is a fuel, um, so it gets put into gas. It has tons and tons of medical uses. In fact, one of the reasons that um, like distill, distillation happens is uh, kind of to create, you know, medical, to have alcohol for medical uses and for um, chemistry and things like that. Um, so there's tons and tons of industrial applications. So like most of the fermentation that happens on this industrial level is in commercial level is uh, to make alcohol for all sorts of stuff. So what kind of things can clue us into fermentation? What kind of clues do we find in the archeological record? Um, the fermented items themselves, and these are very exciting to find. It's all about preservation, preservation, preservation. And a lot of this does have to do with location, location, location. Um, so when we have extreme conditions, we see that things uh, that are organic will last longer. Um, so this can be really hot, it can be really dry, it can be really wet, it can be, uh, I did my opposites wrong there, hot or cold, wet or dry. Um, we can also have anaerobic environments. So once again, when we don't have oxygen in an environment, all these other organisms that wanna break down organics don't survive, right? Um, 
So we can find, uh, you know, the actual items, but more often than not, what we're finding is actually just just sediment, just little bits of things left. Um, when I do talk to kids, you know, it's like if you broke a plate, are you going to wash it before you throw it away? You're probably not. You're probably just going to throw it in the trash dirty. Um, and it may not have the whole steak that you had for dinner, but it's still going to have like some juices or maybe a little piece of gristle or fat on there. Um, and so a lot of what we find will be things like this. Uh, a lot of vessels that have alcohol and that folks study specifically looking for those things are found um, in places like tombs. So these might have been things that were kind of left as offerings or, or things that go with the dead, you know, part of cultural practices of death um, and remembrance. So uh, but, you know, through the years, the, the wine evaporates and all you get left is little scuds in the bottom of your pot or your jar. Um, so we can do, I call it science magic, and it involves scraping out the sediment and putting it in a mass spectrometer. And you get these fancy readout graphs that tell you, you know, what kind of things are in there. Um, and what scientists are really looking for are kind of markers that will tell us, um, you know, what was in there. So, for example, beeswax, if you find beeswax, uh, there is honey involved because you, no matter even in our modern fancy ways of processing honey, you can't get all of the beeswax out. There's always going to be a little bit of beeswax left in that. Um, so that's a good marker for honey, for things like mead. Um, tartric acid is associated with grapes, so that could suggest wine. Um, so you can kind of think about those kinds of things. Uh, and folks are also starting to look at like the DNA evidence of yeast so they can figure out, you know, was there yeast here, was there not yeast here? Um, and in some ways they, in some settings, they've actually even managed to capture the yeast and start to breed them again. And we'll look at that a little later in the presentation, but people are, are starting to brew with or bake with these, uh, these ancient strains of yeast, which is really exciting. And I'm just such a nerd, so I get very into this stuff. Um, we can find, uh, you know, historic uh, written documents, we can find oral histories, uh, traditions that are passed down um, as evidence of that people were doing things. Um, so Pliny the Elder, for example, in his Naturalist Historia, uh, describes how folks in ancient Rome would create um, uh, essentially starters to bake bread using, you know, flour and water and um, I think they would even throw little grapes in some of these to kickstart with some sugar and some, some yeast that might have been on the grapes naturally. So um, pretty cool to read about that. Uh, one of my favorite written documents actually goes back to ancient Sumeria, and it is the Hymtan in Kazi. And she is the goddess of brewing. And, um, you know, this, this it's like a prayer to her. It's like a, it's, it's written to her. Um, but it goes through all of the different steps of brewing beer. So growing the grains and malting them and, and making the mash and fermenting it and filtering it and drinking it. And, um, you know, it's, it's talking about her kind of being the fermenter. You are the one who holds with both hands the great sweet wort uh, and wort is unfermented beer. Um, brewing it with honey and wine, right? So it's this great, uh, it's, it's really fun. So um, in some ways, it's a guideline to how to make beer. Uh, we see evidence in art. So uh, there's tons and tons of, of things from places like ancient Egypt that here's a, an image of a bakery and you know, of, of, of brewing and all sorts of things that people were doing. Um, you know, we can find, uh, here's a gentleman holding a, uh, a, a wine vessel, something you drink wine out of from, um, ancient Greece. And uh, even in the New World, we see tons of fermentation happening. Um, so these are a couple of images that uh, have cacao beans represented in them. Um, so folks are, you know, putting, we, we do the same thing, right? We, we take what we know and we put it into art. So they're, they're representing these things um, in the artwork that we see. And then of course we can find uh, the actual sites where these things are being uh, made and processed and the tools that are used for them. Um, so this is uh, an example of a, this is a bakery that was found at Jamestown, which is pretty fun. Um, so it, they would have been fermenting some sourdough bread and baking it in these ovens. Um, and this is a Phoenician uh, wine press and they smash the grapes and, and ferment in there. So um, really cool to find those kinds of things because that lets you know a little bit more about the, like, the, the creation process of, uh, you know, not just what they had, but how they made it. Um, so to talk just, you know, broadly about ancient fermentation, I'm going to touch on, you know, some uh, fermented foods and, and beverages that we find and some of the evidence and some cool sites and just hit the high points. And this is by no means in any way an exhaustive list. Um, and I can make some recommendations if you're interested in learning more about some of these things. Um, 
it really does have ancient origins. A lot of the folks who write about these things, uh, like Dr. Patrick McGovern, who um, has, has, he studied, uh, he does a lot of the, the isotopic analysis of vessel, vessel sediments. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of speculating about when people started consuming alcohol and how we figured this out. And, you know, folks probably just kind of stumbled upon like palm trees that had the sap that naturally ferment or, or you know, maybe a, a, a beehive that got knocked over and filled with water and that uh, honey won't start to naturally ferment. And we, we, we figured this out and then we uh, liked it and we started trying to do more of it. Um, and you can see, you know, we find fermented goods from all over the world. And a lot of what we find uh, has to do with the environment, it has to do with the cultural practices. So, you know, different things are fermented in different ways, uh, depending on, you know, what, what's there and what the cultures are doing. Uh, and the word itself is cool because there's a couple different places that the, the, the word ferment starts off or becomes synonymous uh, with the word boiling. And if anyone has seen, once again, your starter to, uh, your sourdough starter on the counter, if you've ever brewed beer or fermented pickles, you'll see it starts to bubble, right? That carbon dioxide starts coming up out of the liquid and you get this nice froth or foam at the top. And um, so it makes sense that you would connect, it makes that connection of, of boiling with the fermenting. And it's really not until the 1850s that uh, we have kind of this definitive scientific evidence of, of the process and what's happening. Um, and Louis Pasteur is credited with that. And he um, you know, definitively confirms that it's yeast that's causing this fermentation. And that it's this little tiny organism, a uh, little fungus doing all this hard work for us. And, um, but you know, we've obviously known about it and we've known how to cultivate it. Uh, you know, maybe without understanding exactly what it is. Uh, so, you know, once again, plenty of the elder talking about, you know, saving back a little bit of the starter to put in the next batch and um, you're essentially cultivating yeast colonies, right? But, you know, so folks may not have put it in the language or thought about it or framed it as scientifically, but they definitely knew, what, knew something was going on and were very excited and knew how to continue their practice. Um, so fermented fish get us off to a very good start here. Um, but we have a really cool site in Sweden and they have uh, just a huge pit. You can see kind of a picture here of this dark uh, organic staining of the soil. Um, it was just a huge pit of fish bones and uh, it's estimated that it contained up to 60,000 tons of freshwater fish, lots and lots of fish there. Um, and, and when they looked at the fish bones a little more closely, they had evidence of acid damage. And so it's, it suggests to researchers that this was uh, fermented fish. And, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of things about it does, why would you just bury 60,000 tons of fish, right? Like it makes sense that they would have um, tried to, to process and ferment them and keep them as a cache uh, to come back to and eat later. Um, but if you think about, you know, modern Norwegian, uh, like pickled heron or gefilte fish or whatever, uh, you know, the bones can get eaten away by some of those uh, acids and, and, and fermentation. So, um, and of course, you know, once again, still a, a practice that is uh, practice, something that people do all over the world. Still, um, a lot of folks, especially up in the Arctic, where it's really, really cold, um, you know, they may not be able to access fishing year round. So they will, uh, you know, think of ways to, to preserve fish to keep it, where you can have a steady supply. And in some ways, um, the fermented fish can actually have more nutrition than just if you went and fresh caught, you know, a fish. So it's also uh, beneficial to do that preservation step. Um, milk, as I mentioned, uh, most people are, you know, like lactose intolerance is, is a big thing, uh, and especially in certain parts of the world. And we're the only folks who keep trying to consume milk past infancy. Um, so it's, it's thought that fermenting milk is a way to help us uh, process it. You start to break down those, those uh, lactose, right? Those sugars that are in the milk. Um, and then that it makes it easier for our, our stomachs to, to handle it. Um, the oldest evidence we have of cheese making is around the Mediterranean and it's 9,000 years old. And you can see on a map, um, some of the different spots that we found. Um, so they found both kind of like that science magic isotopic analysis kind of trace trace elements of dairy lipids, which um, suggest that they were, they were fermenting milk and then evidence of uh, more solid evidence of cheese making in a couple of different places. Uh, and they, of course, it's not just uh, cow's milk, it's goats, it's, you know, all sorts of different kinds of, of, uh, of milk that they're, they're um, turning into cheese. Um, cheese is, is 
you know, in some ways a kind of a fermentation um, because you're taking uh, enzymes and bacteria from the inside of a uh, cow's stomach, um, a cow that has never had milk, and you use that to kind of jumpstart that like curling process of, of that results in cheese. So um, yogurt's another thing that's uh, fermented. You're putting, you know, these active cultures in there and kind of changing the milk. Uh, and, you know, once again, there's like an interesting preservation and kind of um, like a, a, a more practical explanation for, you know, why folks may have started to eat milk. So we have evidence of, uh, of cheese making going back in the British Isles, uh, almost 7,000 years. And this is, um, they found these pots that look like, you know, these are some examples of more recent cheese strainers. And here's some examples of, uh, of the vessels that they found. Um, but this makes sense. Once again, if you have a cold environment and you can't grow things all year round or things aren't naturally growing all year round, um, but you have cattle, you have dairy cattle who are producing milk or goats that are producing milk all, and you can make that happen all year round um, to try to figure out a way to make that something that you can eat, so. Um, but we do have evidence from all over the world. Uh, and one of my favorite, uh, more interesting types of fermented dairy um, is called kumis. And this is uh, found, it's uh, still actually made by some of these uh, the folks who are, it goes back to nomadic cultures on the, the Siberian steppes. Um, and they, they in some ways still make it, but the, the story is that they would, uh, you know, have a, a nice drinking horn and they would put the horse milk in there and they would ride all day and it would ferment all day. And then, you know, they would drink from it and leave just a little bit left in there and refill it with fresh horse milk the next day and ride around and um, there you go. I think I, I, I would definitely try it at least once, I will say. Um, so bread, um, leavened bread is fermented. Um, even if it's not sourdough, it's still technically fermented. But um, you know, often we think of uh, you know more of the, the the spontaneous fermentation that happens with other um, uh, with, with those kinds of of. Anyways, uh, all bread is fermented, but I think a lot of folks think of the extra kind of fermentation that happens with sourdough bread because it's uh, more spontaneous and less of a controlled yeast but it still uh, would be considered fermented. Okay, um, so evidence of breads goes back thousands and thousands of years, but if they aren't leavened, it doesn't count. So we're gonna skip over that part. So evidence of leavened bread, um, we found in Egypt for almost 5,000 years. And here's these little lovely loaves of delicious bread up here in the top corner. Um, and you know, we just find tons of evidence. We find the loaves themselves, we find art, we find tools, we find the bakeries, you know, all of these types of places. Um, same in ancient Greece and Rome. So we have, uh, this is a loaf from uh, Pompeii. And, um, you know, they just found tons and tons of carbonized bread uh, as a result of the, the, the volcanoes encapsulating those towns there. Um, and just, you know, most of these, when we think of bread now, most of it's made out of um, you know, very specific wheat flour. And, and that's not true through time. There's tons and tons of different types of grains that were used for making breads, immer and spelt and um, all sorts of things. So, you know, it's not always wheat bread. So that's also something to keep in mind um, when, you're, when you're thinking about some of these things, you're looking at some of these things. Um, the oldest piece of bread we have in Europe is uh, from Lower Saxony, Germany, and it's almost, uh, or at least 2,500 years old. And this one is, made from fine wheat flour. So a little more like what we may think of, uh, of as a loaf of bread there. The new world, uh, you know, the Americas, we see fermentation happening. Um, chocolate, if you love chocolate, you love a fermented good. So um, the seeds in the pulp of cacao are fermented and this is kind of the, the first step in processing and making chocolate. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting uh, evidence of these, uh, you know, this happening um, through South America and into um, Central America and Mexico. Um, you know, we, we definitely know the Olmecs were making it as early as 3,500 years ago. Um, but there's actually some really cool work going on in Ecuador that has an earlier date. Um, and, you know, one of the ways that they identify chocolate is uh, through a, a, this chemical that's found in cacao called theobromine. And so we'll find that in the, the vessels doing the sediment analysis, and that's how they're able to identify um, the chocolate that was there. 
Uh, but you know, lots of different cultures make it all through time. Um, it's still being made, you know, in, definitely at contact and through the colonial period because we see the Spanish get really excited and actually bring it back to Europe, and that's how um, you know it becomes a global phenomenon, right? Um, so, and this is just uh, some cool art depicting, you know, the fermenting cacao there, and they're you know drinking the making it and drinking it. Um, and this little artifact, I do like to, a lot of this is not about Florida, but uh, here's my here's my Florida connection. Um, chocolate was made popular by the, the Spanish, and so they're drinking it here in St. Augustine in the colonial period. So this is actually a chocolate frother that was found uh, here. And um, I can just picture, you know, spinning that and whipping up a nice glass of chocolate milk or hot chocolate. It's kind of a fun thing. Um, so to switch over to alcohol, um, you know, this is a really interesting, uh, a lot of the work on fermentation kind of focuses on this. Um, and just to, to kind of step back and, and think about it more broadly, you know, there's uh, several kind of general kinds of alcohol, alcohol. So we have wines, which are generally made from fermented fruits. Um, and this fermentation, once again, will happen naturally um, that a lot of the fruit ends up with yeast on it. Um, is, is listening to a podcast about fermentation and yeast and they were um, a lot of scientists are trying to figure out how yeast moves around because it's not like it floats on the wind in in ways that like seeds may or other things um, and they think a lot of it gets moved around by insects so it'll get on insects legs and they like fly around and they they move the yeast around and and you know they're going after the fruits and the flowers and all and, and depositing the yeast there um, so we have you know evidence of uh, all sorts of you know, fermented beverages, uh, palm sap's a really big one that folks talk about, and it's still something that's harvested and, and made uh, in Africa today. There's like certain types of palm trees that just have these perfect uh, shapes to them where they, the sap gets in there and, you know, the, the insects land and drink it, and then it starts the fermentation um, on its own. Um, honey will also naturally ferment, so um, mead would be fermented honey. Um, if you take uh, honey and you you get the water content up to 20 percent it'll it'll start going so um that's another thought of you know some of these ancient origins of from of, of consuming alcoholic beverages that we could have found uh the beehives that filled with water and became mead and, and drinking that so um and then there's uh beers and so uh beers are generally made from grains um so once again we in modern times think of barley wheat maybe some rice um, but uh, all sorts of different kinds of grains have been, you know, can be brewed as long as they have, you know, some sugar content to them, right? You can make them into a, a delicious beverage. Um, but the thing about the grains is that they require another step to them. Um, you have to malt them, you have to break down, um, you know, the protective layers and get the, the sugars kind of flowing to them. Um, and so it's long been thought that, you know, that those were the kind of wines and, and meads came first and beers came second, but that's not necessarily true. And the more research we do, the more we realize that people kind of figured this out. And in fact, really the earliest beverages um, were a mixture of all of these things. They weren't kind of put into discrete categories. They were all sorts of things. Um, so one of the earliest beverages uh, is a fermented beverage from uh, China and it had rice, beeswax, grape tannins and other herbal constituents. So, I mean, it would have been a mixture of you know, uh, a rice beer, a fermented, like a mead and, you know, some grapes in there. So um, some uh, Nordic grog, I think is one of the earliest things that they have found in uh, Europe. As a, and um, it, it contained a whole mixture of things, you know, honey, berries, uh, different, uh, different plants and herbs. And uh, it also had wheat, barley and rye. So all sorts of things going on in there. Um, so, so beer, I'm going to start off with my favorite here. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, it's not just uh, barley, it's not just wheat, uh, it's just a total variety of grains, whatever you can grow, you know, whatever you're using. Um, and also hops, hops don't really come into popularity until kind of the medieval period. And there's some really interesting history associated with that. Um, beers before that point had something called a gruet in it. And so um, this was a mixture of berries and herbs and all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, it was really used as kind of this flavoring agent and also possibly a way to kind of carry the yeast uh, from from fermentation to fermentation. Um, and hops are kind of built as this, uh, you know, cleaner, better, more modern thing uh, to do with your beer. 
Um, but hops are really interesting because they also have um, qualities that help preserve the beer. So if anyone's heard of IPAs, um, they're called India Pale Ales because the British were trying to ship beer to India and they couldn't figure out, it kept spoiling on the way over. Um, so they they chocked the barrels full of hops to keep the beer fresher and, and so it would be okay um, by the time they made it all the way to India. Um, and, you know, these beers are not going to be those lovely, clear Budweiser's that we know today. Um, they were definitely unfiltered. Um, a lot of them are more porridge-like and, um, you know, they couldn't get any of that sediment or trub or spent grains out of there. Um, so a very different drinking experience than what we may think of. Um, and, and beer actually, as it currently stands, uh, it takes the claim for the oldest fermented beverage um, or the oldest like purposely fermented beverage. Um, they've, archaeologists working in Israel have found this cave site that dates back 13,000 years and they have these um, uh, mortars and, and these pits that they're using to grind grains in. And when they looked at, once again, doing this kind of microscopic sediment analysis, um, they found uh, starches generally present when grains have been fermented. So this is their argument. Um, you know, they thought it was just some sort of bakery or, you know, they were making porridges or, you know, whatever they were doing with it. But then they found um, the starches associated with fermentation. So they have made a claim that it is beer and that folks were making beer here. So. Um, just to look at some beers from around the world, um, sorghum beer is very popular in Africa and some of the African countries, and it goes back uh, thousands of years. Um, and here's a great shot of uh, some more recent sorghum beer drinkers, and you can see that thick, chunky, sludgy, tasty fermented beverage there. Um, and the tradition is that you would drink it out of a long straw, and that also helps to filter. Um, you're also drinking out of a communal pot, so it kind of sets a few boundaries there. Um, but a lot of these kinds of beverages, um, you know, were not in any way brewed and, and meant, you know, bottled and shipped out and, and meant to last, right? A lot of these um, early fermented beverages were um, made and meant to be consumed within a few days, if not that day. And um, so uh, just different, different way of, of thinking about beer and, and, and wines and things. Um, there's a really cool brewing kit that has been identified in uh, the central plains of China. And so here's um, a funnel and some different um, vessels that they think were used for, for brewing and storing wine. And it was in, um, they kind of described it like as this like brewery storage area. Um, so that's really cool. Um, German beers, I think a lot of folks think uh, good beer and they associate it with Bavaria and Oktoberfest and all those things. Um, so some of the earliest evidence that we have there um, is about 1200 years ago. Uh, and once again, they found it associated with a tomb of, uh, of a royal person in Bavaria. Um, and the monastic brewing traditions, um, if you love any of those uh, delicious Belgian ales or Trappist ales or things like that, um, we have found the earliest evidence of brewing in a, at, at a monastery about 700 years ago. So. Um, and once again, to pivot to, uh, to the Americas, uh, we have beer that was brewed here. Um, it was made out of uh, corn or maize. Uh, it's called chicha. And uh, this is another one of those uh, things that has various traditions all through kind of South America and um, Central America, uh, Mexico. There's even uh, cultures that kind of straddle today's, you know, U.S.-Mexican border um, sites uh, like Casas Grandes, uh, where they were uh, making chicha. And so the traditional way of brewing this, it's still a tradition that folks carry on today, is you chew the corn and you, you know, everyone sits around, you all get a mouthful of corn and you chew and you spit and you chew and you spit. And then um, that helps kind of start that germination. It helps get the sugars going and the enzymes start to break things down and, and cause it to, um, you end up with some lovely fermented uh, corn beer. Uh, and Patrick McGovern has made some, uh, he does the ancient eels uh, with dogfish head and they, they actually had got a bunch of folks to sit around and chew and, and make some today. It was kind of funny. Uh, they, they had it at a big, uh, the, the great American beer festival and everyone's like, are you going to try it? Are you going to not try it? I mean, you're going to boil it. It's going to be delicious. Anyways. Um, so uh, we know this tradition goes back thousands and thousands of years. Um, we found evidence of uh, breweries uh, 
So here's a Wari brewery with different uh, brew pits there. We find it in artwork. Here's a lovely uh, sculpture and she has her, her chicha vessel there. Um, and I mentioned Casas Grandes. Uh, they found uh, evidence of the chicha in, in uh, tooth plaque, which is kind of cool. Um, so, you know, people were consuming this uh, and we, we can tell people we're consuming it, right? Um, mead, so fermented honey, it was, uh, you know, it was popular in ancient Greece and Rome and in the Mediterranean. Um, and there's a long history of this, uh, of, of meads and of honey wines in African countries. Um, and a lot of these traditions, of course, continue on today. Um, and there's some really cool artwork. Uh, I think this is made from Zimbabwe um, that depicts, you know, people interacting with bees. And these, these, uh, some of these drawings are thousands of years old. So um, we know people knew about bees and knew about honey. And we can make, you know, I think folks kind of make an assumption that they, they figured it out. And we're probably enjoying some fermented honey as well. Um, some studies of coprolites, and uh, it's always a good talk when I can talk about coprolites. Um, coprolites are fossilized uh, fecal matter, so poop, um, shows that we have folks consuming mead in Austria and Sweden, uh, going back at least a thousand years as well. Um, wine, of course, uh, you know, folks think of, of wine as being from the Mediterranean, and, and it definitely has a long history there. Um, some of the earliest evidence we have is in Georgia. And once again, they found um, these really cool vessels. They even had grapes um, decorating them um, that had the, the sediment analysis. They found residual wine. Um, the oldest liquid wine, uh, Germany gets to claim that. And once again, they found it in a tomb. And it's all sorts of beautiful colors and weird chunky bits, but a really cool glass bottle. So I don't know if anyone would want to uh, bust that open and consume it though. Um, and then just to bring in underwater sites, cause you know, wine was definitely being shipped all over in the Mediterranean. Um, and that was such a big part you know, of, of, uh, of the story of wine is being shipped around there. Um, so this is a shipwreck that's, uh, it's about 2000 years old um, and they haven't gone down and, and you know, actually started working there. They've sent, um, they've done kind of side scan and, and some photogrammetry and all, but they haven't like excavated the site. Um, but they have about 6,000 amphorae at the site. And so if, if it's all wine and it, it may or may not be, there's lots of reasons to believe that it could be um, 200,000 bottles of wine on one shipwreck. So it's a lot. Um, and this is, you know, not an uncommon find. There are uh, lots and lots of examples of wine bottles that were found on shipwrecks. Um, there are some that just went up from uh, auction for $30,000. Um, and then a couple that people have actually opened up and tried. And um, I, uh, my mom and I um, love laughing at the, the wine flavor note descriptions. Uh, I think the best one we ever saw had hints of asphalt. Um, so I would like to share with you some of the tasting notes on some of these. Um, so there was a 170 year old champagne bottle uh, that was found and it had animal notes and wet hair. Delicious. Uh, and then they found a 150 year old bottle of wine on a Confederate supply ship uh, down near Bermuda. Uh, and here they are drinking it at an event in Charleston, South Carolina. Lovely, lovely color notes on that. Uh, and they described uh, crab water, gasoline, salt water, vinegar, with hints of citrus and alcohol. So um, maybe not so good after a couple of hundred years. Um, and just to, to make note, you know, of uh, some of the lasting implications of colonial trade here uh, is that we are consuming things like wine and, and beers and uh, rum. Um, one of my favorite new fun facts about St. Augustine is that when it was founded, Pedro Menendez brought uh, 720 essentially uh, olive jars with him. That's 11,000 bottles of wine. I mean, that's how you start a city, right? I bring all, all, all the beverages. Um, but the, the um, sugar industry becomes really important too in the Caribbean um, and rum really becomes one of the biggest exports uh, that gets shipped to the colonies and everywhere else. Um, and just the lives that were uh, changed and terrible <laughs> and ruined from you know, the folks who are, are doing this uh, are largely enslaved peoples. Um, so that's you know, definitely one of these big impacts that happens with some of these things. 
uh, and something to keep in mind uh, when you when we have these conversations. Um, and then we found, you know, some evidence of uh, of the production happening here, uh, you know, starting up here in the New World. Um, George Washington, uh, his house at Mount Vernon, they found a really well preserved uh, still site. So uh, there's there's chatter and jokes about getting that still going again. That would be kind of fun. Um, there's a, a gentleman, he goes by the, the, the name, uh, the bourbon archaeologist, the whiskey archaeologist, uh, Nick Lorientes, and he uh, works in Kentucky. And he's done a lot of work with um, some of the big bourbon makers, like uh, I believe this is Buffalo Trace, uh, where they were renovating one of their historic uh, distilling, and they found buildings and underneath in the basement, they found these old vats that were used, you know, when the company was founded 100 plus years ago. Um, so they actually restored them and they are um, fermenting the mash to make, you know, whiskey to distill. Uh, they're using them again today, which is kind of fun to see. Um, and he's also worked at lots of um, like moonshine still sites as well. So he does some really cool work. Um, and just to, to talk a little bit about experimental archaeology and carrying on old traditions, um, you know, we see tons and tons of experimental brewing. Um, there's these crazy sites in England and Scotland and um, where they have uh, wells and they have hearths and they have these big troughs and no one can quite figure out what they were used for and there's lots of lots of ideas um, and one of them is brewing so some uh, industrious archaeologists recreated one of these sites and brewed a beer to uh, pretty pleasant reviews but I think their final decision was that was a lot of work in this kind of uh, infrastructure so maybe that's not what they were doing here <laughs> there are other explanations that make more sense um, we're seeing lots and lots of commercial recreation. So um, Patrick McGovern working with Dogfish Head to do the Ancient Ale series um, was kind of at the, the forefront of this and started this many years ago. Um, I believe you can still get some of them. Uh, a lot of them are kind of limited runs, but like Midas Touch is one of the standards that you can still get. Um, and so that's uh, taking the sediment analysis and recreating the recipes based on that. And so each of them kind of have their own story and he's done brews from all over the world. Um, folks finding these uh, bottles on shipwrecks and kind of harvesting the yeast and then making beers using the old strains of yeast. So there's several different uh, varieties that are different companies that have done um, those kinds of beers. And then um, there's also a lot of breweries that are just trying to recreate old recipes. So um, Avery Brewing has uh, the Ales of Antiquity line. And so they're just trying to make um, you know, beers kind of in the style of old. So what would a India pale ale from this colonial period taste like? And, and um, you know, using kind of a combination of recipes, but also just um, a little historic research, a little archeology span that doing some cool things. Uh, there's a, a whole team that worked to recreate Egyptian bread. So I showed you those nice squashy weird loaves. Um, here's, here's what the loaves would have looked like hot out of the oven. Um, there was a, a team that worked, they harvested the yeast from uh, these really old vessels. Um, this gentleman made, you know, recreated the baking pots, recreated the pit firing atmosphere and uh, made it out of emmer flour. And so that was a really cool project. Um, so with that, I will stop talking. <laughs> I can take questions. Um, yeah. That was great, MJ. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of side conversations taking place. So let me scroll up because I know there are at least a few.